Welcome screen. Uh, just in case we forget, let's all silence our phones. I'm the worst one about that. Let's see here. All right. As we uh, we know Providence has been through a lot the last few years, amen? Yes. Providence has been through a lot. Um, those of us that have been here uh, for a while, we know the history and we know that like what COVID did and what other things did and numbers dwindled down and, and now by God's grace, we are in a, a state of regrowth, right? And, and we're growing. Um, and I, I don't say this for my glory. You guys know me better than that. The first sermon I preached here, I, how many was here just? Seven or eight? Almost. <laughs> and then look what God's doing. Look what God's doing. It's, it's slowly but surely in God's timing, right? We would have it full next week, right? We would have 200 people packing this place out if we could. But God is bringing the right people at the right time. And, and we're growing. And Jamie and I, we talk about this a lot. Our family does. And, and the leadership here at Providence, we talk about this a lot. Spiritual growth is more important than numerical growth. You got 20 of us here. And we're growing spiritually. That's more important than having 200 people packing this place out that aren't even saved. Or that aren't spiritual. Amen. So the goal is to get the right people here at the right time so we can start doing evangelism, which we're in the beginning stages of that, right? We've kicked that off. Um, I lost train of thought what I was going to say. We, evangelism, right? And then discipleship. That's our goals here at Providence, right? Introduce people to Jesus Christ, get them saved, and then disciple these people, right? Get them coming so they can learn scripture, so they can reach out to other people. Is it for my glory or for your glory, Providence? Absolutely not. Whose glory is it for? It's for God's glory and his alone. I am a worm. It shocks me that he allows me to be a part of what he's doing. But praise God, he allows me to be a part of what he's doing. And he allows you to be a part of what he's doing. He does not need us, y'all. But because he loves us, he wants us to be involved in, in his plan. We're talking today about celebrating the gospel. The whole reason I said all that is because as, as providence is in the phase that it's in, um, I felt a deep conviction that we needed to work our way through 1 Timothy. Okay, that we need to, to work our way through that. Now, does that mean we're going to start at the beginning and work our way all through the book with no breaks? That's not what that means, okay? So what that means is we're going to do a series. We did one on guarding the gospel. Now we're doing, we're wrapping up celebrating the gospel, and we may take a break. Depending on the needs of the church. If there's a need in the church and something needs to be addressed, or if I feel conviction of the Holy Spirit that we need to take a look at something in his word, that's what we'll do, okay? Um, but for today, what we're gonna look at is we are gonna be in 1 Timothy and we're gonna wrap up part two in the series uh, celebrating the gospel, right? What have we looked at in Timothy so far? So last time we were in Timothy, we talked about guarding the gospel. And just a brief recap, that means no bad teaching, no bad doctrine, amen? Uh, the health, wealth, and prosperity stuff has, has no place here <laughs> or, or in our lives. And we don't need to be sharing that garbage with other people, right? 
God never promises that everybody's going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperity. Good luck finding that in Scripture. It is not there. In fact, Jesus promises we're going to go through trials and trouble. That's a promise from Jesus. So we talked about that. We talked about guarding the gospel. We talked about how the gospel of God is incarnational and undeniable. Incarnational, what does that mean? We talked about God the Son taking on flesh and being born as a human being, living a life we couldn't live, right? Dying a death that we deserved. And then he rose again and he did all of that so you and I could be saved. That's the gospel that we're guarding. You cannot be saved by good works. Um, God doesn't care if your grandpa was a preacher. That's not enough to get you into heaven. He doesn't care. Well, I was a pastor's kid. So what? What did you do with my son? We're not talking about your grandpa or your dad or your family's Christian history. What did you do with my son? So the gospel's incarnational. God becoming man, taking on flesh. And he did that for you and me. And it's undeniable. It's undeniable. Next, we talked about how the gospel of God is universal and personal. What does that mean? Christ died for sinners worldwide. Christ died for everyone. But it's personal too. It's personal too. It's two, two statements can be true at the same time. He died for everyone. And two, it's personal. He died for you and he died for me. And so we covered that. And then this is where we're going to pick up, okay? We're going to be in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, 12 through 17 again. Let's all stand if you're able. And we're going to stand to honor the reading of God's word like we always do. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible or you don't have it on your device, I will have it up on the, up on the screen. But let me encourage you, get a copy of God's word. Get a copy of God's word. If you don't know which one to get, ask me. I'll help you pick out a Bible. Amen? And then, uh, I forget, version is a free Bible app. It's free. 100% free. It'll even read scripture to you. Okay? So if you don't have that, definitely download that and plan on trying to get a little bit of scripture in every day. Right? So celebrating the gospel, 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Let's go ahead and read that. This is Paul writing to Timothy, and we know that Timothy is a young pastor, and his church is struggling, right? There's a bunch of issues that he's, he's trying to sort out. And Paul, as his mentor and spiritual father, so to speak, is trying to encourage him and help him get these things straightened out. But here's what he says. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, bless the reading of your word this morning in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so when we look at the example of Paul, 
The example of Paul tells us a lot about the nature of God's grace. And what do I mean by that? When we look at that passage, we learn from his example that the grace of God is unconditional. It's unconditional. We need to understand that Paul's salvation originated in God and God alone. There was nothing in Paul to draw God to him. And the same is true for you and me. There's nothing in us that would draw God to us. We're sinners. We're fallen. Scripture says none of us even seeks after God. Scripture says that none of us come to the Father unless the Father draws us. We're talking about celebrating the gospel. Are you here today? Are you saved? That's a reason to celebrate the gospel. Are you here today and you're not saved? You know why you should celebrate? Because you're here right now and you're hearing the gospel. That's a reason for you to celebrate is that God has made the gospel available to you if you're here today. So we need to understand we are not saved based on any condition in us. We are saved solely on account of sovereign grace in God alone. And solely meaning not involving anything or anyone else. God did it. God did it. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I chose God or I found God. Let me correct you. God chose you and he found you. Yes. Celebrate the gospel. Amen. Did we deserve to be found? Absolutely not. And God is so awesome. He's so amazing and so loving. He saves us. He offers us salvation through faith in Christ. We also see that, uh, so number one, the grace of God is unconditional. Number two, the grace of God is purposeful. Look again at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 14. Look what he says again here. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The grace of God produced faith and love in Paul's life. God's grace did this for Paul. Do you want the grace and love of Christ to overflow to you and overflow through your life to others? Trust in Jesus. Trust in Christ. Celebrate the gospel. He can do this for you if he did it for Paul. Next, the grace of God demonstrates his patience. His patience. Again, we see it in uh, verse 14. It's the best news ever for anyone who thinks God won't save them because of how they've treated him in the past. I want you to think about that. That's worth repeating. 1 Timothy 1.14 is the best news ever for anyone who thinks that God's not going to save them because of what they've done. How many times have we read scripture or saw examples in scripture of all the people that God used were sinners just like you and me? Paul was killing Christians. He was imprisoning Christians. He was persecuting Christians. He wanted to wipe the church off the face of the earth. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Committed adultery with another man's wife and had him killed to cover it up. You say to me, well, Eric, you don't know what I've done. You done anything like that? Have you? Even if you have killed somebody. Can God forgive you? Scripture says he can. Scripture says he will. If you repent and put all your faith, hope, and trust in his son and what his son did alone, you can't add anything to the gospel. You can't take anything away from it. If that's you this morning, 
and you need a saver, savior, I can point you to one. I know what I've done. I'm not going to stand up here and give you a list of, of sins in my own life from the past. I know what I was and I know what God saved me from. And I know who I am today. I'm not saying this to impress anybody. Every morning when I open my eyes and take a breath, my first thought is, God, thank you for today. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that I am not who I was. I'm not all the way there yet, but I'm not who I was. You need a savior today, trust in Christ. You need, you need a change in your life. You need to go from death to life. Jesus is your answer. Jesus is the answer. So this is great news for somebody who thinks, well, you don't know what I've done. I don't, but God does, and he says he'll still save you. So that excuse doesn't work. If you're using that as an excuse, well, I can't get saved. I'm too bad of a sinner. That's the only prerequisite. <laughs> it's the only prerequisite, right? And we all pass that test. <laughs> Maybe you're, you could be thinking about past sins. Maybe you're wrapped up in sin today. What if that's you? What if you're caught up in an ongoing sin today and it's killing you inside and you want freedom from it? You want deliverance. You need a savior. You need to be saved from it. Run to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. He can help you. He will help you. So here's, here's good news, man. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about Paul. One commentator put it this way. I'm going to read it to you. He says, God chose to take the chief persecutor of the church and make him the chief missionary in the church. What kind of crazy, bizarre, awesome, cool mercy and grace is that? You don't see that every day. He takes the chief persecutor of the church and makes him the chief missionary in the church. And God did this to show that he's patient, he's loving, and he invites sinners to believe in him so that they may have eternal life. We sang it just a minute ago. This truly is amazing grace. I think about John Newton, the writer of amazing grace. From what I understand, and I'm, this is the nutshell version of his testimony, he was a vicious, brutal slave trader. Horrible. <laughs> Did horrible, unspeakable things to people. And God radically saves them. God radically saves him. And he writes Amazing Grace, and we're still singing it today. We're still singing it today. <laughs> Whoever you are, whatever you've done, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's you. That's me. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. All. That's every one of us. Every one of us. Past, present, future. The only one who was sinless was Jesus. He was the only one to pull that off. And that's the only reason he can be our savior. That when he steps in in our place to pay our sin debt, in our place, God accepts it. Because Jesus never sinned. He doesn't deserve it. If you're in a court of law, let's say me and Lee, Lee, let's say Lee's on trial for being a sinner. Hypothetical, right? Or not, you know what I mean. Let's say Lee's in the courtroom and he's on trial for being a sinner. And I love Lee. Lee's my friend. He's one of the best friends I got right now. Let's say, uh, Lee, you are sentenced to eternity in hell for your sin. God's about to put the gavel down and I say, whoa. Lord, I love Lee. He's my friend. Can I take his place? 
You know what he's going to say to me? You're next. You can't take his place. You're getting the same sentence. You've committed the same crime. Let's say Lee's in the courtroom and Jesus is there. And he's about to get sentenced to eternity in hell, separated from God. Lee turns around and he says to Jesus, I am so sorry for what I have done. And I know that what you've done is you've made a way for me to be saved. And I'm asking you now, will you please forgive me? So that I can have you and, and not hell. Now, when Jesus stands up and says, Father, and God already knows, this may be a really horrible analogy, but just for the sake of an illustration. When Jesus stands up and says, Father, Lee has trusted in me to be his Savior. And God will say, whatever they say in court. Right, Corey, as simple as any of us all think. So you don't want to wait until you're standing before God, obviously, to, to try to do that. You're not going to get away with that. The time is now for salvation. But you understand where all, what all that meant? None of us can pay the sin debt because we're all guilty. When Jesus says he'll pay it for you, God accepts it because he never sinned. That's why he can pay your sin debt in full and get you into a right relationship with his father, with the father. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Next, we see that the grace of God leads to his praise. Look again at verse 17, where Paul says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So when Paul thought about who God is and who he used to be, he was overwhelmed that he would receive this grace and mercy from such a king. Is that you and me this morning? Is that you and me? So Paul thinks about his past, who he was, and how God radically saved him. And he busts out with praise when he's writing to Timothy. He says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever Amen. You ever been talking to somebody and they just get so caught up in the grace of God and the love of God and, and they're just like, whoo, hallelujah, and they start shouting praises. You ever seen that? That should be us. That should be us. Whew. That was Paul. So when was the last time you were overwhelmed because you received such mercy from God? When you hear these songs and we're, we're singing these songs and you're hearing the word and you're hearing all about how awesome and amazing God is and he loves you and me. If that stirs nothing up in you, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned if that doesn't just overwhelm you with thanksgiving. The way Paul praises God tells us several things about the glory of God. What does it tell us? That God's glory is royal and eternal. We all know what royalty is, right? If you're a king or someone uh, that's royal, you know, like a, a prince or something. God is royalty of royalty, man. It doesn't get any more royal than God. God's over all the other kings and princes and queens, and he's over all of it. He's the king of the universe. He's the creator of the universe. That's as royal as royal gets. God is also eternal. Look at this. The Psalms. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting 
to everlasting. You are God. No beginning and no end. No beginning and no end. He is the king of the ages now and forevermore. God is immortal. Right? God is immortal. He's not going to die. Um, death and decay cannot and will not ever be able to touch God our Father. He never gets tired. He never grows weary. God never changes. I remember, uh, I remember years ago when I was learning uh, at seminary, I was dabbling in apologetics and I was learning a lot of really cool stuff. And I was praying for opportunities to share some of the cool things that I was learning. And my friend called me. He's like, hey, my little brother is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. And he's got this friend. And um, I'm worried about him. And they said they're willing to talk to you. And I was like, okay. So I'm like, I'm just going to trust God and talk to these guys, right? Share the gospel with them. I don't have all the answers. I still don't. God does. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to trust you and meet with these guys. And so we go to this Mexican restaurant. I told them I'd buy them dinner. I was making decent money, and I was like, I'll buy you guys dinner. So we sit down, and I said, hit me with the hardest question you got. What's the hardest question you got? And they're like, really? You want to start off with the hardest? And I'm like, yeah, man, let's, let's go. And so they're talking amongst themselves, you know, kind of whispering back and forth, and I can kind of hear what they're saying. And finally, about a minute later, he says, all right, <clears throat> Who made God? Where did God come from? I'm like, that's it? That's your hardest question? And they're like, well, you make it sound like that's easy to answer. I'm like, well, it is. I'm like, is that what you want to start? And they're like, sure. I was like, all right. I said, let me ask you a question. You guys are big into science. And they were. They knew more about science, way more about science than I did. And uh, they were like, yeah, we're, you know, we like to keep up with science and stuff. I'm like, okay, so here's my question to you. Scientifically, do you believe that something caused time to exist and that eventually at some point time is going to run out? And they said, well, yeah, we'll agree with that. And I'm like, so here's, here's my question. If God caused time to exist, and only things that exist in time have a beginning and an end, couldn't he have just always existed before he created time? This dude's burrito, like, he's <laughs> like, okay, I said, what's next? And he was like, man, we talked for three hours. I wish I could say they both got saved, but at the end of the night, it was sad. At the end of the night, I'm dropping them off. And I, I said, uh, you believe everything, all the answers I, I gave you, the answers I could. I said, do you believe those to be true? And they were like, well, yeah, we kind of have no way around it. And I'm like, do you want to turn away from your sin and pray and trust Christ? And No. I said, Why? We, we like our lifestyle. We don't want to give up our, our lifestyle. I said, you understand, if you die tonight, you've rejected Christ, and that means, and they're like, yeah, we know. I was like, listen, I love you all, man. If, if you change your mind, and I hope and pray you do, you get a hold of me. We will. Never did. I have no idea what... But when we're talking about the eternity of God, I just kind of gave that as an illustration. If God created time, and he did, couldn't he have just always existed outside of it before he created it? So he exists inside and outside of time. Right? That's how I felt when I learned that. So verse 17, let's see here. He tells us that God is royal and eternal. He has no beginning and no end. Next, God's glory is invisible and incomparable. God's glory is invisible and incomparable. And what do we mean by that? 
Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without an excuse. These people that claim, oh, there is no God. Look outside. Go outside. Look at the stars. We're going to see that here in just a second. So can you and I see Father God, our Heavenly Father? Can we see him with our eyes? No. Can we see the effects of God? Everywhere. Everywhere. We can see the effects of God in creation. Look at this. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. You ever been camping? Or just up on the roof? Kids don't ever climb up on the roof. It's dangerous. You ever done that though? You're laying there and it's a, it's a clear night. And there's no uh, lights, like big street lights or anything interfering with your, with your view. And have you ever just looked up at the stars and thought, wow, trillions of stars. And the God that created all that loves you and loves me. The God that created you and created me loves you and he loves me. So can we see God? No, but we can see the effects of God. We can see in creation. We can see in creation that God exists. We can also see the effects of the Holy Spirit and salvation and sanctification in a believer's life. You ever seen the effects of God in that way? I have. I see it all the time. We see it in Paul's life when we read about Paul's testimony. He was persecuting the church. God radically saves him. And keep in mind, Paul didn't get asked if that's what he wanted to do or not. Deep thoughts, right? God says, you will be my chosen. <laughs> You're going to do this, Paul. Before you were born, before I created the heavens and the earth, I knew I was going to put this call on your life. You're going to do this. God saved Paul. If you're saved today, he saved you. Somehow in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Somehow in the grand scheme of things, God is sovereign, completely and totally sovereign over everything that happens. And yet somehow we still, cho we still choose I, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't understand that fully. But I know enough about God and I know enough about Scripture to know that His Word is true. And if that's what His Word reveals, then I'm just going to trust it. Somehow, some way, God is sovereign over who comes to faith and who doesn't. And we still get a choice. I remember my friend Greg with a young person when we did youth ministry together. This young person asked Greg, he says, how do I know if I'm one of the elect, if I'm one that is predestined for salvation? How do I know? And Greg says, well, do you want to be? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, good news. Good news for you. You are. So I'm asking you here today, is God sovereign? Yeah. Do you want to be saved? Then you can be saved. And so I said all that to say this. I've seen the effects of God in believers' lives. I've seen the effects of God in people's lives. I've watched people as I've shared the gospel with them and as other people have shared the gospel. I've seen the light come on, right? I've seen God do that to people where the light comes on. Oh, I am a sinner. I do need a savior. I'm really loving this Jesus guy. Lord, save me. 
I've seen the light come on. I've seen people grow over time. We, we just wrapped up a series on the fruit of the Spirit, did we not? About a month ago. Who, who grows the fruit inside the believer? The Spirit. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. Does it happen overnight? No, but it happens. It happens. From the time you profess your faith in Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. Immediately. You get saved, you got the Spirit. What does the Spirit immediately start doing? He starts bearing the fruit of the Spirit. I know when I first got saved, first thing that changed on me was my language. And not cursing is not what saves you, right? I know saved people that st still struggle with that. But what I mean by that is that was one of the first things to change in me, like literally in an instant was my filthy mouth. I couldn't complete a sentence. I kid you not without dropping an F-bomb. It seemed. And then as soon as I got saved, when I would slip up immediately, the spirit in me would be like, oh, and I'm like, Ooh, I'm sorry. Lord, help me with that. And he did. He did. So I see the effects of God in the lives of believers. Can you see the Holy Spirit? No, but you can see his work in someone. Amen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. God is invisible, but if you see that, you can see him working. You can see his work. Though we cannot see God, we certainly see the effects of God. What else can we know? God is the only one true living God. Nothing or no one compares to him. He is the one true living God. All these other worldviews and faiths and religions are all man-made. There's one true living God. God is beyond the limits of what we can see or imagine. Oftentimes, Jess and I will get together and we'll just start talking about theology and talking about God. <laughs> and uh, one thing that Jess is famous for saying, and he's 100% correct, you can't put God in a box. You can't. And sometimes we accidentally find ourselves doing that, don't we? Somebody will say something, well, you know, I don't think God would do that or why would he do it you know and it's you can't put God in a box we go by scripture right but we can't put God in a box our tiny minds our tiny human sinful minds can't even begin to fathom the glory the true the glory of God we think about what heaven's going to be like and we got some ideas I mean we read descriptions in scripture but you know, even in his word, he's taking it easy on us. Not wanting to make our minds explode, right? Jesus is like, if you can't understand earthly things, I try to explain to you. What makes you think you're going to understand heaven if I try to explain it? So we, we, can't, we can't imagine even just how glorious God is. God will receive honor and glory forever and ever without end. Amen. Believers are individuals, local churches, and the body of Christ worldwide. Do you know what we're gonna you know what we're gonna have to face? Trials and tribulation as a church. As individuals in the church, as a church, the, the church all over the world, we're gonna go through hard times. We're gonna face hard things. We're gonna suffer. We're gonna suffer. But do you know what brings me great encouragement today? That Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, is still king. He's on the throne. Nothing's going to change that ever. Ever. And he is the head of the church. Opposition and challenges may come, but God is the king of the ages. He will lead God, protect, purify, sanctify, and preserve his church. 
And that is why you and I can celebrate the gospel today and every day. Every waking moment of our lives, we can give glory to God and thank him. Amen. So let's be like Paul. Let's be like Paul. And I don't mean let's go around and persecute the church. I mean, let's be like Paul after God got a hold of him and saved him, right? Where we can't even, we can't even write a letter. You ever been around a person where, and it gets on some people's nerves. I get on people's nerves sometimes. Don't you ever stop talking about God? I'm like, no. <laughs> and I have no intention of it. Why? Because he's awesome. He saved me. He can save you. I'm like, why do I always talk about God? Because he's most important. God should be first and foremost in all our lives. And if you're not a born again believer in Jesus Christ this morning, let me tell you, you are missing out on the very reason you were created. Don't die without Jesus. Hell is not going to be some kind of a party. Well, all my friends are going to be there. You're not going to see him. Hell's not a party. It's not a place where, you know, you're going to drink with your buddies and, and play cards and joke around about how you ended up there and not in heaven. I got news for you. The people in hell right now would be screaming to us, don't come here. Don't come here. Don't make the mistake that I made. Do not turn your back on God. Do not turn your back on his son. That's what the people in hell would say if they could. Do not come here. And once you're there, there's no way out. It's too late. God gives us now to get right with him. He does everything perfectly. And if his timing is for us to be saved in this life, then do that. And you've heard me say before, don't wait till the end. Don't gamble with that. Don't wait till you're on your deathbed and be like, well, I guess I better get saved. You're not guaranteed you're going to make it to a deathbed. We read about people all the time unexpectedly getting killed in car crashes, brain aneurysms. I mean, you name it. We're not guaranteed our next breath. Don't put off getting right with God. It's foolish. It's foolish. So let's celebrate the gospel. Who's with me? I want to celebrate the gospel all the time. Even we watched a, a, a video this morning of the song, I'm So Blessed. If you think about it, there's something to be positive for no matter what's going on in your life no matter what's going on in your life. I remember reading a, a story of a, of a child that died. And the mom and the dad basically said, you know, we could be angry at God for taking our child. But instead, we're thankful for the five years we had with that child. We're thankful that we raised our child to believe in Christ. And we know that the next time we see our child, there'll never be another goodbye. We're thankful for that. That's what keeps us sane, is the truth that God has made a way through faith in Christ to be reunited forever with our child when it's our time to leave this world. And when that happens, there will be no more goodbyes, no more tears, no more pain. We're thankful for that. We celebrate the gospel for that. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to do that because I love y'all. Amen. Thank you, Brother Eric. <laughs> Let's all stand. And we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. What can you take away from today? Celebrate the gospel. If you've not been saved, get saved today. Quit messing around with it. Quit putting it off. Your excuses don't stand, whatever they are. Well, I'm not ready. 
I got to clean myself up first. You know, when I got saved, when my friend shared the gospel with me, I was in a drug house. <laughs> and he come in and shared the gospel with me. And you know what excuse I gave to him? I said, what, what could Jesus ever want to do with me, man? You know who I am. You know what I do. You know what I'm involved in. And I said, I've tried to change and I can't. My friend looked me in the eyes and he goes, that's right. You cannot change yourself. He said, you have to come to Jesus as you are and let him change you. And he said, Eric, or you're going to bust hell wide open when you die. No one had ever said anything like that to me before. I didn't know whether to punch him in the mouth or thank him, right? He's like, you're going to bust hell wide open when you die. I was like, man. And that stayed with me. So if that's you today thinking, well, there are some things in my life I got to get right first and then I'll get right with Jesus. That's a bunch of garbage. That's a bunch of nonsense. It doesn't work that way. You come to Jesus as you are and let him change you or there's no hope for you. You'll just keep going in circles. You might get better for a little while, right? Oh, I've gone this long without looking at pornography. Or I've gone this long without a drink. Or I've gone this long. And then suddenly you fall right back into it, right? Next thing you know, you're drinking again. You're looking at stuff again. Whatever it may be. Come to Jesus now and quit playing games. I love you all.